So this is actually the final session I'm gonna be leading today and I have neglected repeatedly in the excitement to do this to highlight again why we're here. So we're here for Coney Island Prep. I would encourage people to take the opportunity, donate to Coney Island Prep, again, a public charter school in New York City based in the Coney Island, Brighton Beach area. Just an extraordinary story, something I've been involved with for years. Education is obviously something that Danielle yep. has been supportive of Absolutely. in the past, and you have been a very generous donor as well. So I encourage people to do that as we head into this. Yeah, I mean, truly, it's an organization where every single donation makes a difference, a true difference in somebody's future. So it's very powerful. Well, and, and, and actually, now that we're doing that, I want to add one more point, which is just the unique focus of, of the donations that are given during this event are actually for those 100% of, of Coney Island Prep students who graduate from high school are accepted into college. One of the things we often forget is that for children that are coming from affluent families who come from a history of attending college, going to college isn't really that hard. I know that my daughter has certainly you know, tapped my credit card more than a few times to pay for expenses. But kids that are coming from places like Coney Island typically don't have the resources to handle the unforeseen expenses, to handle you know, the issue of, oh my gosh, what happens if my laptop breaks or something else, right? And so actually the funds that we're raising here contribute to the funds that are used to support students of Coney Island Prep who are going off to college, providing them with incidental spending money to address those emergencies, to address the things that are part of a normal process, something that is very rarely thought about and just in my opinion is again one of the things that indicates how clearly Coney Island Prep has actually thought about the process of taking these kids, giving them the opportunity and taking them to that next level. So with that as quick background, Danielle, welcome. Thank you, thank you very much. So, Good afternoon everybody, I'm happy I actually got here. <laughs> well, I, I'm- Traffic in the rain. Traffic and rain in New York City, not something that you are unfamiliar with. Nope, this was as bad as UN last week. Well, and one of the, the, the topics that you and I have spent an awful lot of time talking about over the past couple of years, and you, know, you obviously with your work and your initial book, Fed Up, mm -hmm. and your work at Quill Intelligence as a consummate Fed insider coming off of Wall Street, and then basically moving into the role of both Fed critic and Fed supporter in a lot of ways, actually trying to help people understand the choices that are being made. Yes, indeed. Um, it, it's a complex beast of an organization. And there are, despite the book being an insider's take on why the Federal Reserve is bad for America, there are some good people in the organization who mean well. And um, I, I think that that's misunderstood. I, I get told on Twitter all the time, oh, you're a shill for the Fed. I'm like, I, it's called Google. Just try it, just Google my name. But if you say anything supportive of the Fed, all of a sudden you're, you're the bad guy. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, this is an interesting thing. So in the last couple of years, I've been called a statist, right? I've been, you know, called a shill for, uh, yep. you know, for the public. You've been labeled as, a, as, a, as, you know, a supporter of the Fed and all the choices, despite the fact of having written this book. But the mission is actually really important, what they're trying to accomplish, right? The objectives of price stability and full employment are really, really important. Is that actually what they're trying to do? Uh, they, um, they are. They really are. You know, the, the, the addition of the second mandate in 1977 into 1978, you know, the Carter administration, the misery index, when you added the uh, unemployment rate to it, the inflation rate, you got this massive number. And, you know, it was kind of a cry for help uh, from, from an administration that could not figure out how to address the unemployment of the era. And so they said, well, we'll just We'll just hand it off to the Fed and see what they can't do about it. The problem is the two mandates are inherently conflicting. And I think what we see time and again is, is that Fed policy is like a pendulum. It swings too far to trying to be, two years ago we were talking about a Fed that wanted to be all inclusive. It wanted to get every single unemployment rate down for all Americans, all ethnicities. And that, that's what swung it too far to one side. Now most would argue I think your commodities panel, I've heard, that the Fed's gone too far and that they've over-tightened. And, and yet, even if you're looking at headline CPI, which, you know, I was always a big fan of Stanley Fisher, who came out of retirement to make sure that Janet Yellen didn't break the financial system when she was appointed at the Fed, which is a very real risk. And now she runs the Treasury Department, so just tread lightly. Um, but he came out of retirement, and the first question he ever asked at his first FOMC meeting was, why don't you use the headline CPI? He asked that of the staff. And, you know, one 
you know, one brave, intrepid staffer raised his hand in the back of the room at the Eccles building, and he said, well, if, if we used headline CPI, all of our models would break. We wouldn't be able to conduct QE forever. So they have to stick to a measure of inflation that is internally known as, as fallacious. When I was there in, in 09 and 10, a good bit of 18 months was spent with staff papers flying all around the organization, all 12 districts. The board in Washington, D.C., they did a deep dive, you know, existential. Why did we miss that inflation? Well, it was asset price inflation. So we need to come up with a new inflation metric. And after all of the, the teeth gnashing, they decided to do nothing. And I decided to write a book. <laughs> so, um, so when you think about that, distinction between asset inflation and headline or CPI based inflation. Mm -hmm. This is actually kind of one of the areas where I think you and I occasionally spar, right? I mean, how much of it is a function of really low interest rates? It's only been 11 minutes. I know, I know. And here we go. <laughs> Took you a while, Mike. How, how, how much of it is interest rates? Because I mean, we're watching this phenomenon right now where you and I think would both agree that the Fed has probably gone too far in hiking mm -hmm. at this point. Yeah is the consequences are going to come, but it's not showing up in asset markets. I mean, bond markets are getting hammered, but... No, I mean, look, home prices are the most... I mean, if it, talk about lag data. Mm -hmm. Home prices are more lagged than jolts. Home prices are more lagged than inflation. Home prices are more lagged than, than the unemployment rate. Nonetheless, we saw home prices come in, case Schiller today, at the fastest ever pace. Now that's gonna come down, because Redfin has told us we're finally seeing inventory trickle onto the market. And we're starting to see the housing market begin to break. It took a lot to break this housing market because it's a monster of the Fed's creation. But to my mentor, Lacey Hunt's point, when you abuse monetary policy, it becomes less efficacious with every round of trying to tighten. And because he's of the view that velocity is going to make a U-turn and decline over the next 12 months, that means that even if the Fed decides to come roaring back in, trying to ameliorate the damage they've caused, it's gonna be a lot hard, harder for them to do so. Into an election year with a GOP led House of Representatives that it's, that's not gonna write stimulus checks. So the feds alone until March of 2025 in terms of what they can do to try and undo the damage that they've done, which was done to undo the damage that they did. did. <laughs> yeah. and, and that's the thing, it's very circular. And I think the reason Jay Powell wants to kill the Fed put, and here we can take the gloves off. I think the reason he wants to kill the Fed put is he realizes that there's no way out of this loop. There's just, there's just something is gonna have to give. And he wants for it to be the markets that make monetary policy. I mean, that's what he talked about in October of 2012. In the transcripts, you read what he's saying, he's saying, Let's not do this third round of QE in October 2012, because if we do, we're going to create a policy from which we can never exit. These are his words. He knew what was happening way back when, and now he finds himself in the position of trying to finally make an exit from this policy, and markets don't want anything to do with it. They want the zero bound yesterday. They want quantitative easing immediately. And, and you know, I mean, they want their pacifier back. But I mean, with the S&P at 4,400 and somewhere in the neighborhood of 21, yeah. 22 times earnings, depending on what number you want to use, where is this evidence that the market is screaming for 0% interest rates? Do you want to try and sell commercial mortgage-backed securities today? No, I gave up that jog a long time ago. But yes, I agree with you that there is a huge difference between liquid markets at highs and frozen markets, right? And I mean, part of it is, right, it's that real estate was a 2023 story. Because you had all of these 2010 through 2012 paper, all, you had all these loans that were extended during the pandemic, and now we hear from TREP that they're, they're extending these maturities by between one and 12 months. Months, not years months, hoping that we get back down to the zero bound so that they can 
have the buyers and sellers come together, or you have the place that was uh, the building that was right next to Penn Station that was sold out of foreclosure and whatever for pennies on the dollar right yeah, now as down 75%. Yeah. Exactly. So it's trash or trophies that are trading. Everything else is not, but guess what? 2024, it becomes a corporate bond refinancing story. That's different. And if he holds on through 2024, right before I came on stage, I checked 23.7% probability of a rate cut in March. That's not very high. First rate cut. If he holds on into 2024, you're going to have the same situation in collateralized loan obligations that you're having in the CMBS market. It's a slow bleed, but it's a bleed that's caused Goldman to lay off three times now because the deals aren't getting done. Well, which you could argue is actually part of the objective, right? Uh, obviously, well, yes. with. Um, but on the flip side of that, we have Chris, you know, Chris Waller, who's come out and said um, the impact of the rate hikes would be faster because we were so forceful in our application. Um, you know, the expectations channel has been clearly played through. <laughs> you seem skeptical. So, I mean, that's kind of the Goldman Sachs school of thought. I love Jan Hatzius, but the idea that we've already kind of washed away the lag effect, we've gotten past that little nasty affair. Mm -mm. Lag is cumulative when tightening is of a degree, and that's, it's a graph that I just refreshed in last week's quill. Lag is cumulative if, if you're in a higher for longer regime, which we are. So right now, today, if you're looking from a, from a delta standpoint, from a starting point standpoint, in terms of the amount of tightening and the persistence of the tightening, we're six months shy of Powell beating Volcker's record, just by holding on. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the other thing that I would add to that, right, is, is that a contract is only something that reprices when you restrike the contract, right? And so debt, it tends to be a long-term contract, it's actually You've obviously you know, seen me talk endlessly about zero data expiry options, yep. which have their own speculative fervor around them. But at the end of the day, they're one day bets, right? It's hard to get a systemic event built around one day bets, yep. right? But if I enter into a contract that is five years, 10 years, 15 years, as many debt contracts are, mm -hmm. It doesn't matter until it actually restrikes, right? right? Until I re-enter into it, and so that's what you're highlighting with the 2024, the beginning of the repricing wall, particularly as it relates to high yield securities. It's a little bit longer for investment grade, although they also tend to trade on spread, which has been really, really tight. And they have been, but by the same token, because companies have not been able to refinance since the reign of terror started. Even the average maturity of investment grade bonds has come way down. Yeah. So you're going to have to find more and more bankers willing to bank on Jay Powell being run over by a train. And that's what it would take. And don't get me wrong, they, had, they are stacking the board with the most progressive individuals I have ever seen. With Pat Toomey out of office, we just, the, the Senate just confirmed two individuals who their combined body of academic work advocate for CBDC, MMT, UBI, uh, climate change, and reparations, all of which can be addressed with monetary policy, which is hooey. It's not correct, but they advocate for it. And my point is, I think that a future generation, a Powell-less Fed, would be very much on board with being of being the subject of an LBO by the US Treasury, which is what the Fed was. The Fed was conscripted in March of 2020. They just did the bidding of Congress. Mm -hmm. They just monetized $10 trillion in the blink of an eye. And they weren't really making monetary policy. They were just facilitating helicopter money. So this is definitely one of the things that I actually encountered at that time. And, and in all candor, like in my communications with the Fed, my reaction was very much, if you guys are going to shut things down, you need to actually make as much money available as possible. Mm -hmm. They did that, and, and then they kept then going. Some. Yeah, and then they kept going. Mm -hmm. There was this massive Game of Thrones business going on between Lael Brainerd and Jay Powell. They put him on ice for six months. Um, Randy Quarles quit in protest, and his first public interview, he said, there was no policy being made. There was the Lael Brainerd camp, there was the Jay Powell camp. 
the face of the Fed kept saying transitory, but internally there was absolute turmoil. But you, had, you split the staff by the staff not knowing who the next chair was going to be, Lael or Jay. And that six months was toxic. Well, in that six months, we're actually seeing this echo because you bring up the staff, and I agree with you, by the way, my interactions with the staff, they're some of the most talented economists, some of the most thoughtful individuals. They're often... Especially when the economy slows down, you get real talent at the New York yeah. Fed. Well, you also, I would, I would say a step further, and this has been one of the things that, you know, as, a, as a, an amateur economist, I guess I would describe myself, but, you know, it, to the extent that we're watching the academic literature explode coming out of the Fed because we've had an extreme event, right? We've tested the tales of the distribution. Mm -hmm. We're actually figuring out stuff in economics that we've never seen before. But exactly to your point, I'm actually increasingly seeing the staff sidelined. And it's oh. basically like, yeah, whatever those guys say, who cares? Look, John Williams has returned to his academic roots very quietly. Yeah. And he's still running 140 Liberty. The man who never had a Bloomberg on his... Bloomberg terminal on his desk when he was head of the San Francisco Fed has quietly reverted back to being his true inner dovish academic self. That is scary. Yeah. Really scary. And, you know, word on the street is that Powell's getting his guidance. His, consigli his consigliere is no longer inside. He's getting guidance from the, from the outside because he was misled. But you're saying because he, was, he feels that he was misled by the staff, particularly because of the use of the phrase transitory. Average inflation targeting? I mean, contrast that speech, which was written by the staff for Jackson Hole. Contrast that with his eight minute and 28 second speech two years later at Jackson Hole. Yeah, that's one was written by Jay, the other was written by the staff. But average inflation targeting was probably the worst policy error in the history of the Fed. And that's saying something. God love you, Arthur Burns. But that's saying something. Well, the, the real challenge that that introduces, right, is it requires foresight, right? We need a forward-looking average, right. which is almost by definition impossible. Well, plus, unless they didn't. The, the facts changed, but they didn't change. Yeah. I mean, average inflation targeting would have worked. Right? Because Bernanke in January 2012 finally gets his precious 2% target. And between 2012 of Jan January 2012 and the pandemic hitting, he hit his 2% target in 11 separate months over a decade long period. Why? Because the transmission mechanism of monetary policy was through the banking system. And the banking system was impaired. And the banking system was impaired. And banks were still saying, you get credit, you don't. But handing households money, directly depositing money into household accounts, bypasses the banking system as the arbiter of credit and kills the traditional transmission mechanism of monetary policy. So therefore, your average inflation targeting regime cannot exist when monetary policy is, is, is muted and you're giving people money directly, which creates inflation overnight. So you've also been a leader in... Um one particular area of the stimulus. Just one? Just one, just one. But if, if, if I think about you know, what happened in that March time period, that March, April time period, you know, the immediate reaction was, let's provide credit to the system. We're gonna, end it, we're gonna create these things called PPP loans, right? And we're gonna push them into the system. But before they were even able to contemplate what are the terms of repayment, they announced, yeah, and we're just gonna cancel them. Right? So it turned into an equity infusion that went into effectively small business, connected business, those who could figure out the terminology. Rolls-Royce sales never look back. Rolls-Royce sales never look back. I'm not kidding. But then you were one of the first and most um, aggressive in identifying the ERC. What is ERC? Well, it was mainly because I had egg on my face because I'm like, where's the recession? It was like, where's Waldo? I mean, where's the money coming from? Because December 2021, U.S. households got their final child um, tax. I never got it. Whatever. Advanced payment. Credit, yeah, yeah. In cash. Yep. But the last cash that Uncle Sam gave average working U.S. people, I'm not talking about food stamps, that helped. I'm not talking about the expanded Medicaid rules, that helped. But I'm talking about cash, 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 cash. That ended in December 2021. Something at that point should have started to break, if not for another source of direct cash to people stimulus. And yet you're starting to hear from households, I can't make ends meet. 
and you know, in UMICH or conference board this morning, you know, you're seeing that, that people who make north of 125,000, they're happy. And you're seeing this disconnect begin with lower income cohorts. I'm like, what? it can't just be the stock market wealth effect. It can't just be the housing wealth effect because that's paper money. Something's driving this and that something has a little baker's hat on and his name is Kevin O'Leary. And when, when the Biden administration came on, they took this employee retention credit, which was if your business is interrupted because of COVID in the calendar year 2020, you can claw back up to 21,000 of payroll taxes per employee. Biden came in and expanded it and said, if your business was interrupted through the third quarter of 2021, and you can claim up to $26,000 per employee, but I'm gonna expand it to include startups. If you started up a company, I think you have a, didn't you? Didn't, uh, yeah, so yeah. My, my son Ryan, who I referred to earlier, he received a notice from a, uh, uh, I'm not even sure what you call them, a, advisory firm that sent him a, a solicitation. Upstart, that he, 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 hey, yeah, whatever. Spindler? But so Ryan actually did a small startup in which he hired some of his student friends during uh, the kind of 2021 phase of the pandemic when he went back to school, had no paid employees and received notification that he was eligible for up to $250,000 in credits mm -hmm. associated with the ERC. Yep. His reaction of course, of course was, I think I should probably do that, don't you think, Dad? I'm like, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> you are not touching that with a 10-foot pole. Mm -hmm. But not everyone has a you know, ridiculously conservative father for an advisor in that process. And a lot of people also, and this is kind of where the tragedy begins, because uh, I call him the commish. I like have a framed picture of him, the IRS commissioner, Danny Werfel. Love him. <laughs> But this, this is the only time in history somebody has actually said that about an IRS person before. But anyway. Well, he, he got my research, and I was screaming to the high heaven, you know, stop the ERC fraud. Um, but a lot of small business owners, if you look at, since they made the announcement on September the 14th that they were, uh, they were putting a pause on the employee retention credit, um, at the beginning of the month of September, to, to contextualize, had this thing kept going, and it was going to keep going, your $30 billion a month in the month of July, $29.8 billion was directly deposited into, call it high net worth Americans checking accounts. That would have been a $400 billion run rate for a, for a year. For a program that was originally budgeted for, I think it was 50 billion? 50, 60. Yeah. So 30 billion in a month. Yeah. So, uh, and again, uh, you know, Ty Burrell, innovation taxes, he was all, I mean, Super Bowl ads, these people. And telling everybody that they all qualified, collecting 30% commissions, like ambulance chasers. So Werfel pulls the plug. Beginning of the month of September, it was a $6 billion run rate. And at last check yesterday, it's down to $4 billion because the IRS said, if you think you might not should have applied for this, and you, then, then you don't have any kind of penalty if you withdraw your application. And by the way, we're going to come get you and throw you in jail. It's a criminal offense if they go and find people and they cannot pay money back that they got. I mean, Andrew, there was somebody in our, in our chat room six months ago who they'd sold their family's business to private equity, 75% of it. And over the course of the next six months, they were going to be getting a seven-figure employee retention credit. Not bad money. And we've drawn the correlations between international travel. We've drawn the correlations between high-end housing, between high-end Lamborghini sales. And you see, since he's pulled the plug on this, look at a chart of LVMH stock. I don't believe in coincidence. But right now, again, until March of 2025, if there's a blue wave and somebody runs over Jay Powell, which I think is highly feasible, I would be getting a bodyguard right now if I was him, then they can come back in and start the same type of stimulus and reignite inflation all over again. 
So that I was unaware of. So wait, you're saying that this can re this process can restart without? So you, well, no, I'm talking about two different things. The oh. ERC is on hold until January okay. the first. All right. But QI research is going straight to the head of Ways and Means. Thank you, God. Um, and I don't think they're going to do it. But what I'm saying is that the Fed can once again be recruited to yeah. monetize money, yeah. hand it directly to the people. Again, somebody who's just been appointed to a 14-year term to the Federal Reserve Board fully advocates for central bank digital currency. That's all, all you are as a Federal Reserve is just you know, the doer. You just do the bidding of the progressives. Well, what you're highlighting there, I mean, ultimately, when you say that the, um, and Jay Powell has used this language, right? The Fed is the fiscal agent of the U.S. Treasury, mm -hmm. right? I mean, um, the, the Treasury has its checking account at 140 Liberty. Right. At the same time, interestingly, they set the cost of funds. I've never seen a fiscal agent do this before, but they set the cost of funds for their primary client. Mm-hmm. When you look at the pressures that are beginning to emerge on the budget, oh. it was highlighted for me you know, earlier today. Somebody sent me a message saying, you know, can you believe that there's a trillion dollars worth of interest expense now? Is the, is the pressure overwhelming to just make that go away? Oh, my gosh. When you have Rick Scott and Elizabeth Warren co-sponsor a bill to defang the Fed, you could not pull people from either side of the far side of the spectrum, politically speaking, and they're co-sponsoring a bill to kill Jay Powell. I mean, it's the pressure's- Not run him over, but defense. Not run him over. Yes. No. You know, they're not gonna call up, you know, whoever no. succeeded Gotti, I don't know. Um, they need, don't you think they need a new, like a new good mafia movie? I mean, what it's been like since Goodfellas here, right? Oh, come on, The Irishman, was, that was oh, terrible. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, it was terrible. No, it was awful, I went to sleep. Um, anyways, it, it, and, and we don't really know. Supreme Court precedent goes back to the late 1800s, the last president who tried to fire the head of a federal agency. And if they try, and you could see that going into the election, you could see them trying to fire Jay Powell for cause. If that happens, from what I understand, the members of the Federal Reserve Board can say, until we hear final word from the Supreme Court, we can opt to keep him in this position of leadership. Interesting. Or not. Or not. Because he's not popular. He's running out of advocates. He's yeah. running out of, of allies within the Fed. I mean, you've got Goolsby, you've got Daly, um, you've got these two wackos who are now on, on the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, you've got Daly turning back to being a dove. Neil Kashkari will do what anybody tells him to do. Um, so it, Bullard's gone. Um, you know, you, you have very few people who are genuinely sound money thinkers. Well, so what you're highlighting, I think, is actually an important component, right? So we've gone from effectively the emergence of the monetarist wing um, for an extended period of time, the hard money component. Certainly that was, people tend to think about Volcker as having targeted interest rates, but what he was actually doing was targeting money supply, right? That was when so, M2 was still allowed in the Eccles building. Right, right. And so, you know, the underlying dynamic, when we see that volatility of interest rates in the early 1980s, late 1970s, early 1980s, like post-1979, we're not actually watching the Fed in a thoughtful way to say, you know, well, we think the right price of capital is X. They were actually trying to fix the money supply mm -hmm. and the price of interest rates, the price of money was allowed to move in response to a fixed quantity. Until Volcker said white flag. And, and people forget that part. Is that Volcker actually, if you read the transcripts, right, Volcker actually quit. He's like, I, I couldn't put up with this nonsense, right? No, I, he called I, a Saturday afternoon press conference in front of Labor Day. Yeah. And the press was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're off today. Exactly. Uh, but, but that is actually, I mean, again, like th this for me is the most frightening aspect of this, is that I'm watching Jay Powell mimic what he thinks Volcker did without actually looking at what Volcker did. Because they don't care that M2 growth is negative and getting more negative. 100%. They don't care that as... Lacey explained to me last week, by the way, if you have not seen the Lacey interview, it's, he's such a stud, 81 years old, and he's still amazing. But if you look at other deposits liabilities every Friday afternoon, 4.30 Eastern, when the H-8 is released, right now we're at $1.6 trillion that we've seen ODL decrease. And that's a multiplier effect of two for every dollar that rolls off the Federal Reserve's balance sheet. 
Jay Powell thinks that, that that's why nobody can touch quantitative tightening. Right. Jay Powell will not let, the press is gagged. You may not ask, you, if you ask Jay Powell about the balance sheet at an FOMC press conference, just like Pedro da Costa asked about the Medley affair in front of Yellen, you'll get your ass thrown out and you'll never be asked back. And the press cannot ask him about the balance sheet. He's planning on running perfectly parallel policy. So th this is, I mean, I think you're hitting on the component. By the way, we'll actually provide a link to the Lacey Hunt interview that you recently did. It was phenomenal. It really was. I strongly encourage people to look at it. <laughs> That's not why it was phenomenal. But, the, um, but, but he is actually explicitly making this point, right? I mean, Volcker was targeting money supply growth, and money supply growth has turned far more negative than it ever did under the Volcker administration already. We're in 1937 already. right now. Right. And so we're looking, you, you and I are very much trapped in this mode, and Lacey is obviously on board as well, where we're watching the money supply contract while the focus is on what's the appropriate level of interest rates. And then we're going a step further, and we're looking at what's happening in the bond market, and we're somehow or another suggesting that that's indicative of, well, maybe the level of interest rates should be even higher. I mean, I, I listened to the commentary today. It was just Welcome like... Welcome to Looney Tuneville. I mean, yeah. this is crazy stuff. Yeah. I don't think these talking heads know what they're talking about. Not that they ever have, but still, I mean, you're talking about some crazy shit here. So well, I know I don't know what I'm talking about, but the, the underlying dynamic that you're, we're, we're hitting on is, is that it really does feel that we've lost the actual thread of what we're trying to do. We're trying to get a trailing inflation number down, right? It's like, well, by definition, guys, that happened in the past as compared to what we're looking at on a forward basis. Yep. So it's a little terrifying. I'm not encouraged by this conversation. No, and we're about to shut down the BEA, the BLS, the Census Bureau. We're about to just, you know, go into a vacuum when it comes to data with a data-dependent Fed. Now, one of the things you and I have spent a lot of time talking about is actually the quality of the data that we're receiving. <laughs> okay, expand on the, on the, the chortle. <laughs> so, A, Jay Powell knows that Jolts is garbage because the St. Louis Fed and the Dallas Fed got together in 2021. They released a paper that determined that 90% of all job openings were specifically written. They, like, attached some algorithm to it to poach your competitor's best employee. You don't have to train them. So it's the cheapest way to go about hiring somebody is to get your employer's best, em your, your biggest competitor's best employee. 90% of all job openings. Fed staff paper. It's it, he's it, completely it, it, ignoring it. I, I have to add one more wrinkle to that, actually, because... And the, and the survey, you the, right. tell them. Well, the, <laughs> the survey response rates are below, like, un unbelievably bad. But the, the, the best part about that research, actually, was the reason why, right? Because you want to show that you're a really successful company to post your, com your competitors away. You show how much your job, you're, you're growing by posting a ton of job openings, yeah. right? I mean, it became the most perverse signal. And, I mean, work from home, that means that you could post one job opening in 50 states so it's one position you're trying to fill but it's from anywhere on planet earth so you can you post it 50 times and, 50, and, and you get the, the multiplier effect is just asinine yeah look we've had we we've never had we've had seven negative revisions to non-farm payrolls in a roll coming out of 2009 and coming out of 1980 1981 so in other words, post facto, po coming out of recession, we've had seven consecutive months of negative revisions to non-farm payrolls. And here we are. And next Friday will probably be an eighth. And every time there's a revision, we find out that it's somewhere between 39 and 42% of non-farm payroll creation over the past trailing 12 months is an imputation called the birth death model, which Mike Green created. Um, I'm kidding. But, but there's this massive imputation effect for non-farm payrolls and the lags in terms of when it's revised away with actual data from the Department of Labor, which also has garbage data, you know, you have to wait 18 months. It's ridiculous. They're, they're, they're basing, they're driving 100 miles an hour through the rearview mirror. That's how they're making monetary policy. Yeah, that's, that's an encouraging image. Um, you asked me to come and talk. <laughs> exactly. For good cause. Um, so when does this hit? When does this show up? Where is the recession? So we look at breath. We look at September of 2022 when there were zero states in the United States with rising 
continuing jobless claims, zero. And as of last week, there are 47 states with rising continuing jobless claims. So your six degrees of separation have been whittled down to two degrees of separation. You know someone who's, I know someone whose daughter's lost her job twice in the last six months. She's in media. Um, so people know people who've lost their jobs. There is a rejection rate of 32% for initial jobless claims. Um, Which is, by the way, a direct byproduct of increased enforcement actions against fraud that occurred during the, during the pandemic. Unintended consequences. Yeah. Um, you know, your former state's got an $18 billion bill they owe the government. We don't see severance. Yellow trucking gave everybody severance. So there's 30,000 positions that vanished off the planet, and they're collecting severance payments today. And yet, last week, on the initial jobless claims front, we had 71% of states, which is a recessionary read with rising initial jobless claims. The 0.3%, I'll stick my neck out here, increase in the unemployment rate ain't going away. We're going to see it go the other direction. Because we're seeing part-time, for economic reasons, we're seeing full-time job losses. It's all happening. It's just happening really, really slowly, which you can kind of understand when the US government is in wartime mode with fiscal spending. I mean, we've had the ISM New Orders Index contracting for five straight quarters. You gotta go back to the great financial crisis to find such a streak. How the hell is it declining and contracting for five straight quarters with the US government pumping trillions of dollars into construction, infrastructure, EV plants? And it's, it's still, the rest of the, pri the private sector right now is a disaster, manufacturing-wise. So the one obvious link, right, you mentioned home sales are a lagging indicator. Mm -hmm. But we just saw today home that prices home prices, are, I'm home sorry, home prices, prices I'm sorry. Home, home, home sales, home home sales have already totally collapsed, you're correct. Home prices are a lagging indicator, and yet today we're actually looking at home prices have recovered, and they've now set new all-time highs. Yep. But, you're looking at data that's three months old. Okay, so if I look at that same data three months from now, is it gonna show home prices down 10%? Turning back around. Not down, but not, 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 not by a lot. It's a turning down. Turning down. And what does that, so, so one of the things that catches my attention on that, and you and I again have explicitly talked about this dynamic, when I look at these homes that are being sold, mm -hmm. the narrative is very straightforward. And it's the same thing I hear from every corporation out there, that the only possible outcome is that interest rates are going to be cut and therefore you'll be able to refinance your mortgage at a much lower rate and the home that is currently unaffordable becomes affordable. So I'm looking at Andrew, smiling again. Um, That's because she likes you, Andrew. <laughs> well, I hope so. Yeah. You're fired, I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, it, one of our clients is, is, has got one of the largest title companies in Texas. And he's been doing this for 40 years. And he is horrified at the realtors telling people buying their homes, just look at it as a lease. And once the Fed goes back down to zero, then you can refinance your mortgage and your payment's gonna be, you can work on your payment then. So don't look at your payment right now as being anything that you're gonna get stuck with. Cause you're gonna refinance your way right out of this, pronto. And that's how homes are being sold. We had a conference call today with a client. A woman has been, for 40 years, she actually has been writing it down on a piece of paper that she continues, she could like wrap the world in this piece of paper for the last 40 years on, what's it called? The, I'm, I'm bad with the Jersey Shore. Long, Long Beach Island. Okay, it's like an 18 mile long Beach park, Island. Yeah. With 19,000 units on it. She's been selling for 40 years there. In 2009, she sold, in 2009 there were, in this little community, 313 transactions that closed. This year she sees that closer to 250. So she's gonna wipe out the lowest year of home sales in a, a second home community that she's ever seen in 40 years. She's battening down the hatches. She's, her words, not mine. I've been doing this for 40 years. I've never seen so much demand pulled forward with the actions of the Federal Reserve. Well, and that very clearly is actually part of what they did, right? So we saw it pulled forward and now there's an element of we're just seeing it shut off. One of the key risks, of course, is, is that if they do end up following through on those expectations, cutting interest rates to 0%, that we effectively just kick right into another speculative frenzy. 
But what you're highlighting, I think, is the same thing I'm seeing, which is it's much less financial markets that are actually begging for the return of the Fed put. It actually is weirdly become ensconced within the real world, right? The yep. corporate sector, the household sector are increasingly convinced. You see it in the narratives on Twitter, on down. Yep. I've, I've been known to spend time on Twitter. The, you know, Inconceivable. that- Inconceivable. Yeah. <laughs> I deserve that. The, the underlying dynamic of it is actually everybody expects this, right? It's, you know, Fed printer goes burr, that meme, right? So there is actually something I think really important about sticking to this process. But the cost, I think, where I think you and I both come out to the same place is that would have been great had we gone to 2.75, 3%. We might have been able to address some of those components. We could have paused, et cetera. The dot plot says we're not going past two. Well, that's what it said, right? Well, Jay Powell's Federal Reserve is not going past two. Ever again. He has decided that that is the wrong tool, that ZERP is the wrong tool, that QE is the wrong tool, that they're both failed experiments. So what is the Fed's response going to be when the inevitable break occurs? Inadequate. Oh, that's not a good response. Plus, again, the only reason that, I mean, it, there's a chart it, going into tomorrow's quill that shows, that shows fallen angels in 2020 in the triple B sector. It was biblical. That gives you an idea of the magnitude of challenge that they had to address when there was a financial event of shutting down the economy. But the response required equal parts, fiscal and monetary. And as I just said. The fiscal's not coming. Not until March of 2025, if there's a blue wave. And on the flip side of it, you're saying the Fed is also hamstrung and is going to be inadequate in its response. If there's not a fiscal component to it, it's not enough. It's not enough. Because all they've done is buy more time and build more debt in the interim, which is all the Fed ever does, which is why the Fed's, anyways. You sound fed up. I am fed up. I'm still fed up. <laughs> Awful. If I think about... Um, why asset markets haven't responded, right? Part of it, I, I think, is very much the ERC, right? So the ability to, to buy LVMH goods and also buy Apple stock mm -hmm. um, is very clear. And they're the same cohort that's collecting 6% on their cash. Right. So they're in a really sweet spot. But crazily enough, we haven't actually seen, like if, if I had told you in 2012 that we were going to look at a risk-free rate of 6%, I think most people would have thought that valuations would be dramatically lower. Armageddon. We're just not seeing that. Yeah. yeah, no, we're not. And all the stock jocks now have become credit guys. Yeah. All of them. They all talk about spread. I don't see it in the spread. And I'm like, well, what was the fixed income ETF universe back in 2007? Crickets. Yeah, I mean, that's actually the, the, to me, that's the most fascinating thing, as you know, like my, my macro model is basically say this is exactly the repeat of what we saw in 2006 and 2007, where spreads are artificially compressed, even as, you know, effectively a low beta response to the Fed hiking interest rates. Mm -hmm. But man, is it hard to convince people that there's oh, an actual issue out there. This is, I mean, I never knew what a pain trade was. This is like 1999 walks into... Uh, I, I, my driver coming from Fox didn't know what I did. I could have gone on to, you know, to talk about, you know, a hurricane that's brewing up. He didn't know who I was, but he just cracks up a conversation with me. Do you, do you know anything about interest rates? And I'm like, uh huh. <laughs> I do. I know a thing or two. You do? When are they coming down? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, it's like 1999 meets 2000. It, it, the, the, I, I know what pain trade is now. I mean, I'm in pain just because nothing's reacting the way that it should because of your work yeah. and all that flow business you talk about. Yeah. Well, that's my fear, unfortunately, as, as I say all the time. I hope I'm but wrong, but I think I'm breaks, right. It's going to like yeah. break. Well, I, 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 that is the implication, right? Um, and I guess the question I would ask is, you're aware of it. Do you think the Fed sees that? I 
I think Waller sees it. I think Powell sees it. Um, you think Waller sees it? Mm -hmm. That surprises me. Mm -hmm. Mr. The worst effects are behind us. Yeah, they all talk a line. I think that there are a handful of people on the inside who understand the game of chicken that they're playing. But for the moment, at least, we all talk about the reverse repo facility and, you know, money market funds and treasury bill purchases and blah, blah, blah. But there's a repo facility. So if you're using a bowling analogy, we used to just have one guardrail. Now we've got two guardrails. So, you know, the idea of a repeat of November the 14th on for 41, November the 14th, 2018, 41 days forward, not a single junk bond issued, you might have a better liquidity backstop than you did back then. But 41 days of no issuance, that's what you pay attention to. Not spreads, not CMBS, issuance. Well, so again, this is the thing that's catching my attention in the high yield space is we've seen the maturity profile of the high yield index just collapse, right? It's That's now below year five years, right? Right. It, next year matters because it starts next year. Yeah. And then there was nothing this year. And that's the other thing. I mean, again, this has been the subject of some of my recent writings is on this issue of if you're going to be selling paper in 2024, you're out there marketing it now, mm -hmm. and they're not. Mm -mm. No, they're not. And when you see what's happening in the private equity space, and I mean, we can only imagine. Right? In the chat room today, somebody was like, yeah, a margin call. And I'm like, margin call on private equity. What? And what that means is demanding more collateral. And so we don't know how bad the liquidity backdrop is. We can't know because the, the non-banking system is $240 trillion globally, and the conventional banking system's $180 trillion globally, and we only get a prism into issuance in a $2 trillion portion of that. So we see nothing. Yeah, we see very, very we little. We see very little in terms of what the actual liquidity backdrop is. This is such a cheerful way to end the day. Um, please give freely to Coney Island Prep. You won't have any in another year. Um, On another subject, my, my Longhorns are doing exceptionally well. Anybody know the last time the Longhorns beat a top three ranked team on the road? I wasn't even born and I'm old. Go Horns. Anyways, um, I digress. I love my Longhorns. So there have been, you know, we mentioned this idea that when we go through events like this, we learn something new. What has been the biggest surprise for you? What did you learn, other than obviously ERC and the dynamics of programs run amok? What I have learned is that it's possible to engineer a controlled demolition. And that's the word that I constantly use, controlled demolition. Can you expand on that? What is it? What, what, In a million years, I would have never thought that we would have had the highest number of companies with more than $50 million in liabilities filing chapter 11, and in many cases, just saying, we're not getting there, we're just going straight to right. seven. I would have never thought that we would have seen the highest number since 2010, and nothing's broken. Yeah. We're still- I mean, other than the out. failure of the 16th largest bank, the you know, 40th uh, we, largest look, bank, et cetera. We, we've had crises along yeah. the way. And you know, the regional banking crisis ain't over. It's not, it can't be, not if he stays higher for longer. And that's what people don't understand. My good buddy, Peter Bookvar makes, he says it so well, it doesn't matter that the Fed's possibly finished raising rates if they just hold on. The delta between what they have to, where, where their borrowing costs were and where they have to be, just that alone, if he just holds on, is crippling going into 24. Yeah, I, I absolutely don't think it's a coincidence that we've seen the market, the risk markets turn significantly lower as the market has embraced the fact that the Fed is higher for longer. That, that I think we had fought against that for a very long time. I think it was viewed that this was a temporary move, that it was likely to be reversed yeah. relatively rapidly. And then you take, you know, in the, in the dot plot, two rate cuts yeah. off the table, and everybody's like, what? Yeah. And for now, he's still got control of his committee. Yeah. I don't know how, but he does. It won't last forever. 
It won't last when the unemployment rate's higher. What do you think is actually, so you think that's the driver? You think that because oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the dual mandate is being met at least on one factor at this is, point? Yes, I mean, the unemployment rate is still south of 4%. So the academics can still wrongly, I mean, they're still stupid. Yeah. There's no cure for it. So. I don't like the phrase stupid, but I understand what you're saying. Um, I meant to say short-sighted, it just yes. had so many syllables. Buried in theoretical, shall we put, maybe put it that way. Model-driven analysis. Model-driven analysis, okay. yes, yes. We can, come up with a, we can come up with another four minutes and 30 seconds of these phrases. The, um, so the controlled demolition, is that useful? In the sense that making, creating capacity in uh, this economy such that good players can come in and take the place of stagnant, dead zombie companies is critical to escape velocity, which is a term we don't use enough anymore. You want for a recovery to be self-sustaining, not engineered by zero interest rate policy. Or by out of control fiscal spending, right? Correct. I mean, that's, this is 100%. That's exactly where I was hoping that you were gonna go with this because it leads you to kind of the next question is there something to be hopeful about? Is there a positive lesson that others have learned from this or? Well, look, there's, I mean, AI scares the crap out of me. But on the other hand, again, if you open up capacity for productive players to come in, somebody's gonna figure out how to hire people and generate employment and, you know, make America great again, but like not, you know, not like redneck fashion, like really make America great again. And, but, but, but facilitating, fomenting, keeping zombies alive, it's been going on since Alan Greenspan took office. And it's not healthy. But, you know, for the, for, for it's, it's, it's in our national security interest to let bad players go. Yeah, that's, I mean, you obviously caught the tail end of the last panel that I was no, I on. Didn't. Oh, you didn't, yeah, no, it was on national security and investing. Oh. <laughs> um, so we are, we are very much aligned on exactly that point. I guess the other thing that I would add to that observation um, is that we have made, you know, my concern is that we have ultimately made the retirement system of America tied to financial markets as compared to- Not right to, now. Well- Not right now. It, right now you can get 15% on private credit plus cash. Our, our mutual friend Ralph has, it, yep. it's really beautiful. You, I mean, private credit has zero leverage, none. And you can get 15% because they're coming in and raping and pillaging private equity. But you, if you can get 15% on 20% of your portfolio and, and do asset liability match with the other 80% of it, your, your pension's gonna be whole. You can go back, you, you, can, you can back away from alternatives. Problem is it's not available on the scale that's required. Right, so when we when we talk no, I mean, about private this, credit's not big enough for, it's nowhere near for the enough. entire U.S. public pension system. <laughs> right, it's nowhere near big enough. The other the other component, but private credit does eventually feed its way back into the conventional banking system because once you've come through being, you know, taken private by private credit, you're eventually going to be capable of going back and getting regular debt from a bank. Because private credit doesn't send people in to add debt to the balance sheet. It actually sends people in to run companies, which is a big difference than the Gordon Gecko way of life. Yeah, see, this now we're back to a disagreement because ultimately I think the interesting question is going to be if we end up doing that, the change of control feature that's embedded within private credit or within any form of credit, right, which is this unique feature. Everything I'm seeing actually suggests that what's actually happening is this private credit is effectively stepping in and priming all the paper that is held in various mutual funds, et cetera, around the world. Like the quality of the credit that's outstanding that is actually sitting in those pension plans is being degraded on one side while a smaller notional fraction of it is blowing up on the other side. But this is an argument for another day. Danielle, Gee, it's as late. always, yeah, exactly. As always, you brought it. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you again for everyone joining us. I do hope that some of you were touched to decide to devote some resources to uh, Coney Island Prep. And again, if there's one takeaway from this panel, it's give now because you won't be able to in the future. He said that, not me. Thank you.